Hi there, I'm Sam from Kusin and Kiss. I sell punch needle tools and materials, create punch needle kits, and teach punch needle workshops. I get lots of questions about choosing tools, fabric, and yarn, as well as questions about problems people sometimes have when they're first starting out. So I developed a list I call four tools and four rules to help answer the most frequently asked questions. If you're curious about punch needle, this video is a great place to start. First of all, what is punch needle? Punch needle is a method of rug making. It's similar to, but different from traditional rug hooking. In rug hooking, you pull loops of yarn or strips of fabric up from under the backing fabric. But in punch needle, you punch the loops of yarn into the backing fabric from the working side. If you're making a rug, you'll probably think of the working side as the back because rugs usually lay with the looped side facing up. But I prefer to call the working side the flat stitch side because every time you punch a stitch, you're creating two textures, a flat stitch on one side and a looped stitch on the other. Your work can feature the flat stitches or the loops or combine them to create all kinds of beautiful textures depending on the project you have in mind. Punch needle is a wonderful way to make rugs but it can be used to make lots of other things as well, decorative things and practical things. Punch needle is quite easy to learn, but it's much more enjoyable if you start with the right tools and materials. You really only need four things. There are a handful of common mistakes people make at first, but the four rules will help you troubleshoot those. Once you know the basics of punch needle, I'm sure you'll be inspired to try all kinds of interesting projects. The four tools you'll need are a punch needle, backing fabric, something to hold the backing fabric tight, and yarn. So first, let's talk about the punch needle tool. Modern punch needles come in a few different shapes and sizes, but they all work the same way. Yarn flows through them as you punch loops into the backing fabric. The thickness of the inside of the needle needs to match the thickness of your yarn. And the length of the protruding needle measures the length of the loop. Some punch just one length of loop, and some are adjustable. Most modern needles are threaded one of two ways, either with a threading tool that pulls the yarn through the inside, or if it has an open slot, by drawing yarn over the slot, pulling back and forth until it seats itself in the channel. Second, you'll need a backing fabric. Your best choice is going to depend on the thickness of your tool. Very slim ones, like this one meant to be used with embroidery thread, can be used with most sturdy clothing or upholstery fabrics, like a medium to heavy cotton, denim, or linen. The needle's so thin it pokes through the fabric easily without making holes or pulling the warp and weft threads that make up the fabric. But the thicker the tool and the yarn inside the tool, the more likely it is to make holes in these densely woven fabrics. For these thicker tools and yarns, you want a backing fabric that's loosely woven, ideally with a strong warp and weft thread that moves around easily. This is cotton monk's cloth and it's really ideal for punch needle. The warp and weft threads in monk's cloth move around to allow you to punch thick yarn in. Then when you punch another row next to it, those same threads that moved out of the way get pushed back against those first loops, holding them snugly in place. I want to take a moment to mention burlap. It's an inexpensive alternative used a lot in the past for traditional rug hooking, and people do still use it, but it has some qualities that I think it's helpful to know about ahead of time. The individual threads of burlap are unevenly spun and not very strong, so threads can break easily. When that happens, there's nothing to hold your loops in place. Burlap is usually made from jute or sisal, and the fibers are rough and sharp. Yarn can catch and fray, and over time, the burlap can actually cut through the yarn. 
The third thing you need is something to hold your fabric stretched and tight as you punch. Hoops and frames can be used to stretch fabric tight while you work if you're going to take the finished piece off and make something out of it. Or the frame can be the place you intend to leave your work for display. Whether it's a working frame or the permanent home for your work, you want the backing fabric to be as tight as you can possibly get it. And the last of our four tools, and the one that's the most fun, is yarn. People often ask, where can I get punch needle yarn, or how do I know what to use? One thing I want to mention first is rug yarn. If you are making a rug, I suggest investing in 100% wool rug yarn. It's stronger than most garment yarns, and it has a hard twist. The loops will stay upright and resist crushing when you stand on it. It's also less likely to pill or shed. For other projects, you have a huge range of yarns to choose from. The main thing to remember when choosing yarn for your punch needle is that the yarn and the punch needle tool work together to create the perfect tension. If you're a knitter or crocheter, you're used to creating tension by how tightly you hold the yarn. But in punch needle, the tension is created by the easy flowing yarn and the slight tug of the backing fabric on the loops as you pull the needle out. The yarn should just fill the channel or center of the hollow needle. Too thin and it will fall out, or pool at the tip. Too thick and it won't flow easily through the channel. But just tell me what weight to buy, I hear you asking. Generally speaking, I can tell you that Oxford regular needles and 5.5 millimeter laver needles usually work well with bulky or chunky yarns. And fine Oxford needles and four millimeter laver needles usually work well with worsted or Aran weight yarns. But here you can see the huge variety in yarns labeled bulky or worsted. A lot of these yarns will work, even though they're slightly thicker or thinner, but sometimes you just have to try them. If a yarn only comes in a weight that's thinner than you need for your needle, try doubling or even tripling it before threading it in. This will really increase the number of yarns you can use and can even give you some nice textures you won't get by using a single strand of yarn. One thing to beware of are knots. They might get stuck in the tool. If you see a knot, just try to cut it out before it goes inside the channel. Rethread your needle and carry on punching. For the same reason, be wary of yarns with slubs or varying thicknesses. And don't be afraid to experiment with other fibers and thin strips of fabric too. Now on to the four rules. Learning these will help you have fun right from the start. The four rules are, your yarn must flow freely through the needle. Punch your needle all the way in until the handle hits the fabric every time. When making the next stitch, lift the tip of the needle just barely above the surface of the fabric. The wedge shaped tip points in the direction you're punching and you change directions only when the needle is fully inserted. First, your yarn has to flow freely inside the needle. I'm sure that sounds familiar because I just spent ages telling you how important that is. But if your stitches aren't staying in as you punch, the most likely problem is that your yarn isn't flowing freely. Now that can be because the yarn is too thick or there's a knot, but it can also be because the yarn is getting caught somewhere else. Be sure not to hold the yarn between your hand and the needle. and check that it's not getting caught under your elbow or a button or something. The second rule, hit the handle of the punch needle tool against the backing fabric every time. Remember that the length of the protruding needle is what determines the length of your loop. If you don't punch in all the way every time, the length of the loops will be uneven and may be so shallow they pop back out when you draw the needle out. Be firm and consistent and hit the handle on the fabric 
every single time. The third rule is about not lifting the needle too high as you punch. After you've punched a stitch and as you progress to the next one, lift the tip of the needle just barely above the backing fabric and graze it along the surface before punching back in. Lifting too high will give you floppy flat stitches or pull the loop out altogether. And the last rule is all about direction. The needle always points up and in the direction you're punching. With an Oxford or other needle with a slot, it's easy because you just keep the slotted side facing up. With unslotted needles, I like to put a dot on the handle that indicates which way is up. When you change directions, either you or your work may need to move around. If you're punching a gentle curve, changing directions will happen naturally. But if you're punching shapes with a hard turn, change direction when the needle is fully inserted. Changing directions while you're holding the tool above the work can result in loops popping out. There's lots more to learn about this versatile craft, but if you use the list of tools to get set up and follow the four rules, you'll have a good grounding in the basics and be well on your way. If you found this video helpful, please like and subscribe so you don't miss out on future in-depth videos on tools and techniques, as well as tutorials for fun projects you can follow along with. In the description below, you'll find a link to my Etsy shop where you can buy supplies and kits. If you follow me on Instagram, that's where you'll find photos and videos of projects I'm working on, news about where I'm teaching, or new products in the shop. Thank you so much for watching, and happy punching!